Christian Parenting. Christians say, I believe in Jesus, or I've put my faith in Jesus. But what does that really mean? Join me today as we talk about this most important question. Hi, my name is Ray Reno. Welcome to Family Vision with my parents, Dr. Rob and Amy Reno. Strengthening families through practical, encouraging, and real conversations. Hi, Rob Reno here with Visionary Family Ministries. Welcome back to Family Vision. Now, you may know Amy and I have a big family, seven kids, a wonderful daughter-in-law, wonderful son-in-law, but uh, we still got little ones, right? So we've still got a second grader at home, got a sixth grader, and with all these kids, especially when they were younger, the process of bedtime was not a simple one. And part of the problem is that our kids, especially when we had a bunch of little ones, they don't necessarily stay sleeping in the same place where they start sleeping. So sometimes we get all the kids into bed and maybe they're reading in our bed or something like that. And I stay up, I got to do some things I need to do. Then it's my turn to come to bed and I find uh, my bed filled with children. So before I can get in my bed, I've got to relocate all these small people back to their beds. Now I start with the heavy ones and I work my way down to the small ones. I recently had a birthday that rhymes with nifty, and I do not have the the, the strength to go the other direction because it actually is a a workout because they're totally dead weight. Now, sometimes they are just limp bricks as I pick them up to take them to their bed. Sometimes they kind of hang on, right? You pick up a child and they sort of wrap their arms around your neck. That's nice. Sometimes they just freak out. All right, well, imagine if you were asleep and somebody came and tried to pick you up, okay, you'd probably freak out uh, too. So sometimes you pick up a child and say, don't drop me, don't drop me. Or they say, I'm going to fall, I'm going to fall. And then you, know, you say, hey, it's okay, I-, I got you. My daughter, Millie, 13 years old now, this back when she was uh, a little girl, five or six, I don't know, uh, she had fallen asleep in my bed and so I needed to pick her up. I pick her up, I'm carrying her to her room and she starts freaking out and she says, daddy, daddy, she's sleeping. She said, daddy, don't feed me to the monkeys. Now, where does an idea like that even come from? See, I understand that dreams are like, they're like part of your subconscious, right? So they're kind of thoughts that are sort of underneath the surface and you're dreaming and you're sort of working it out. Well, apparently for my daughter, right under the surface is this concept that her father could feed her to monkeys. Okay, so I don't know, that was a little disturbing, but I got on her bed all as well. Now, as I've thought about that, that situation with Millie, sometimes I've thought that this is like a little picture of God and his children, where he is moving us from our temporary place to our eternal place in heaven. And he knows what's going on, right? The lights are on. He sees everything. He's holding us tight. But sometimes we're in this fog of confusion and and doubt and wondering. And I think a lot of Christians, if we're honest, we've got real doubts. Maybe we don't phrase it like this, but is God going to drop me? Or am I going to fall? Am I really going to be forgiven of my sins? Or what if I'm a bad Christian? What if I sin too big or I sin too much? I was speaking with a father not long ago, and we had been praying for years for his adult daughter to return to Christ and return to the family. She, they had raised her in the church, but um, through a whole series of very sad uh, events, this girl had separated herself from the Lord, separated herself from the family, and, and God had worked a miracle. Fifteen years uh, later, brought this daughter back to Christ, back to the family. My friend was telling me the story, and he told me that one of the key barriers that as she shared her story with her dad. One of her key barriers was this lie that she had begun to believe that God won't welcome me back. God can't forgive me or won't forgive me. I've sinned too big or I've sinned too much. In today's episode, I want to just spiritually encourage you in your own faith, in your own relationship with God, that Jesus is enough, that he is enough and that he has done enough to save you, to forgive you, and bring you safely home to heaven. 
Let's talk about this idea. I've talked to many people over the years who have this mindset that I've sinned too much. I've sinned too big. I'm beyond God's forgiveness. Now, this particular person, they kind of have it half right. In other words, they see their sin rightly. They see their wickedness rightly. They see the giant pile of their disobedience and their rebellion. They see it as this huge mountain that that can't be moved. So seeing their sin big, they've got that right. But their view of Christ is too small. Their view of who Christ is is too small. Their view of what Christ did is too small. Let me ask you a question. According to the Bible, what did Jesus look like? physically. What did he look like physically? Well, there's only three scriptures that tell us about what Jesus looked like physically, and they're all prophecies in the book of Isaiah. One of them is Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 6. It's a prophecy of Christ's suffering. It says that they plucked out his beard during his persecution in the time before his crucifixion. So we can conclude Jesus had a beard. Isaiah 53, 3 says there was nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. So speaking of Messiah, speaking of Jesus, it says there was nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. What an amazing passage. Apparently, Jesus was not physically attractive. He wasn't big, beautiful, tall, strong. He was, at the very least, average-looking, and I think there was nothing in his appearance we should desire him. It's very possible that from an earthly perspective—I don't want this to sound sacrilegious—but from a human perspective, he may have been physically unattractive. The Bible says there was nothing in his appearance we should desire him. So that's something else we know about what Jesus looked like. The third passage that tells us about his physical appearance is in Isaiah chapter 52 and verse 14. And in Isaiah 52, 14, God tells us what Jesus looked like on the cross. And this is what it says. His appearance was so marred beyond human likeness and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. Let me read that again. His appearance was so marred beyond human likeness and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. He had been beaten so badly, he had suffered so badly, that he no longer looked human. I don't know how to explain this or what this would have looked like. Part of the way my mind imagines it is, let's say you were there at Golgotha and you were some distance away and you look on the hill and you see three crosses. On the cross on the right, you'd see a man. On the cross on the left, you'd see a man. But then you would say, what's that hanging in the middle? His appearance was so marred beyond human likeness. Now, why would God tell us this? What's the point of telling us about the horrific extent of Christ's physical suffering? It's to tell us that Jesus suffered enough that he obeyed the Father perfectly in your place, that he suffered completely in your place, that no more suffering is necessary. Do you remember before Jesus gave up his spirit on the cross, he cried out, it's almost done. You're like, no, that's not what he said. It's finished. In other words, the full price for sin has been paid. The full suffering necessary to cover sin has been given. And, And need to address, you know, there are, uh, folks out there and faith systems out there that that believe in a thing called purgatory. Purgatory is a hell-like place, quote unquote. It's not real. Uh, those that believe it uh, believe that it's this hell-like place, and that uh, Christians uh, go there before they go to heaven because they have been kind of extra bad or they've got some extra sins that still need to be paid for. So you see, you believe in Jesus and Jesus takes your sins and he suffers and died for you, but you're such a bad person that you need to add some of your own suffering to it. You need to add some of your own burning to what Christ has done. Friends, Jesus suffered enough. He paid the full price. Now, listen, if anybody needed purgatory, it was the thief on the cross. 
You remember the thief on the cross? There's two thieves on the cross. One of them uh, rejects and rebels against Jesus. The other one confesses his sin and says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, well, after you burn off some of your extra sins, because I mean, you, you haven't even had time to be a good Christian yet. You've been a very, very bad person, and you're kind of doing one of these deathbed conversion things. So you go burn off some extra sins, and then I'll see you later. No. What does Jesus say? Today, you will be with me in paradise. You see, some of you have heard this idea that we're not saved by works. You've heard that. Maybe you've been in a church that's taught that you're not saved by works. Uh, not true. Not true. You are saved by works, just not yours. You're saved by the work Jesus did for you. And Jesus did enough. If your salvation depends on your works, you never know if your work is good enough. Think of it this way. We bring the stain of sin. Jesus brings the stain remover of his blood. Who wins? Our stain of sin or the stain remover of Jesus' blood? Jesus wins. There isn't any stain his blood can't clean. Or how about this? We're the ones who are dead. Jesus is the one who raises the dead. Who wins? The dead person or the one who has the power to raise the dead? Jesus wins because his power to raise the dead is more powerful than you being dead. Or we're the sheep who run away. Jesus is the shepherd who leaves the 99 to come find us and bring us home. Who wins? Jesus. Because his power of finding is greater than the sheep's power of getting lost. And I want to share a principle with you. It's so important both for you and I want you to share this with your kids. Explaining the difference between Christianity and every other religion of the world. All right, you can take every single other religion of the world and put them on one side of the paper and Christianity on the other side of the paper. Here's why. Because every other religion will tell you what you need to do to reach God. What you need to do to go to the good place. What you need to do to be reincarnated as a cow or whatever the good animal is you're supposed to be reincarnated as. Here's a list of things that you need to do. If you do them sufficiently, you can get the good stuff. Christianity alone says there's nothing you can do. In fact, you're dead. Worse than that, you're disobedient. Worse than that, you're devilish. And there's nothing you can do to save yourself. Let me read this for you. This is from uh, Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of the world, following the prince of the power of the air. That's the devil. So you're dead, you're disobedient, you're devilish. And that's the spirit that's now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we're, we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. And it's by grace you've been saved and you've been raised up with him. And he's seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God not the result of works, your works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Perhaps you have put your faith in Jesus to save you. Well, what does that mean? Let me go a little deeper here. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? Or what does it mean to trust in Jesus or put your faith in him? By the way, those words in the Bible all go together, to believe, to trust, to have faith. We have uh, different English words, but they go back to the same uh, biblical word, believe, trust, have faith. So when I tell you I'm trusting Jesus to save me, I mean that as literally as I can possibly say it to you. I know I'm going to stand before God on Judgment Day. And I know he's going to open those books. And I know I am in the deepest possible trouble because every one of my wrong deeds is written in those books. So what's the plan? 
I'm trusting Jesus to save me. I'm trusting that the judge, Jesus, really did come to earth 2,000 years ago. He really did die on the cross for my sins. That he really did rise again from the dead. That he really does love me. And that if I respond to what he's done with repentance and faith, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. That he will not turn me away, but he'll receive me as his son. That's it. I'm trusting Jesus to save me. And you might say, that's it? Like, that's your plan for Judgment Day? Yep. It's all I've got. When he opens those books, it's my only hope. Maybe you remember this hymn. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When he shall come with trumpet sound, O oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Let me go back to the thief on the cross for a moment. I was listening to a sermon the other day from Alistair Begg about this man, and uh, I, I loved the way he articulated it. So again, this thief on the cross uh, repents and he asks Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now, when I was growing up, there was a evangelism training course called Evangelism Explosion. And in this training course, they taught you different questions to ask friends or people that you meet how, you know, how to get a spiritual conversation going, how to get a gospel conversation going. And one of the questions that um, they encouraged you to ask people was something like this, and I'm I'm paraphrasing it, okay? But uh, if you ask the person, hey, after you die, if if you were at the gates of heaven and an angel asked you, you know, why should we let you in to heaven? Why should we we let you into this perfect place? What would you say? What would be your, your answer as to why God should let you in to his perfect heaven? And so Alistair Begg used that. Uh, the Bible doesn't say, by the way, that is what's going to happen. It's just a illustration or a way to get a spiritual conversation going. But uh, Alistair Begg talks about the thief on the cross. So the thief on the cross uh, dies, and uh, in this illustration, uh, he's at the gate of heaven, and the angel says, hey, uh, why should we you know, let you into heaven? And the thief on the cross says, I have no idea. And the angel says, well, did you go through the baptism class at your local church? The thief on the cross says, I didn't even go to church. And the angel says, well, did you complete the new believers course at, uh, you know, your local uh, Bible study? And he says, I didn't even know Bible study. I've never been anything like that. And those questions go on and on. And finally, the angel just says, listen, you've got to give us some reason why we should let you into heaven. And then the thief says, all I know is the man on the middle cross said I could come. The man on the middle cross said I could come. And friends, you and I are in that exact same situation. What right do we have to say we're forgiven? What right do we have to be in any kind of relationship with God? What right do we have to have any confidence of our salvation in eternity? It's that same statement. The man on the middle cross said we could come. All of him, none of me. All glory to him, none to me. Christ sufficient and Christ alone. Let me close with a scripture. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I hope that this conversation today has blessed you, that it's strengthened your faith, that it encouraged you. Perhaps you have been trusting your own suffering or your own good works 
And today was the day that God stripped all of that away from you, and you have cast yourself fully upon the mercy of Christ and his work for you. If you want to talk more about this, if you want to talk about your spiritual journey, if you want to ask questions about this message I just shared with you, the scriptures I shared with you, that Jesus is enough, please reach out, podcast at visionaryfam.com, podcast at visionaryfam.com. I'd love to hear from you, love to talk with you, love to pray with you, love to do anything I can to help you and your family on your spiritual journey into eternity where we live forever with our Heavenly Father through Christ who made it possible. Looking forward to talking with you next time on Family Vision.